Welcome to Tez Talks Radio, the global Tezos ecosystem podcast. I'm Marissa True, and today we're getting a little bit technical by speaking to one of the core team of Tezos development, Emma Turner, who is the senior software engineer at Trilotech in London. Hi, Emma. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Hi, I'm uh, good. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. So we'll start off as we always do. Uh, could you please share your personal story into the world of blockchain and then more specifically Tezos? Sure. I mean, I guess uh, for, for me, it was like a, a long time of uh, maybe hearing about blockchain around the edges. So I remember it uh, being something that uh, people at school would like very excitedly talk about in the, in the corridors between lessons. Um, uh, but I never really sort of looked into it properly or like understood uh, what was what was actually happening. Um, and then sort of fast forwarding a few years uh, in my sort of first, I guess, proper developer developer job, um, I had a colleague that I talked a lot to, and uh, this was sort of back in the, I guess, one of the like first big sort of blockchain blockchain sort of crazes. Uh, sort of 20, 2016 or so, um, so into sort of 2017, and um, sort of Bitcoin's value was was going up, and um, my colleague was like talking to me quite a lot about different things that he was learning. Um, ICOs kept uh, kept popping up there as well. Um, so I think I, I sort of looked into looked into it a little bit more. Uh, Mainly started to understand that there were different different chains and that they sort of tried to achieve different things. Um, but then again, I sort of didn't didn't really sort of follow that off at all until the opportunity to work at Trilotech came up, um, and that caused me to sort of look look a lot more deeply into okay, so what actually is what actually is this about? Like what 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 are these like chains trying to achieve? Uh, and in particular, like the the thing that sort of really struck me about Tazos was the the on chain governance, and for me as somebody who like quite likes nice solutions. Um, it seems pretty pretty be beautiful almost to have this thing that had caused like quite a lot of contention in in other in other chains at times uh, almost be be sort of immediately solved um, and allow people to actually like have a have a voice and have it mean something in terms of how the, the chain progresses over time. So that was I think the sort of thing that got me into got, like really piqued my curiosity at, at the start. So what were you doing prior ahead of working at Trilotech? And then how did kind of lessons from your experiences in the past map onto what you're doing today? Um, so before before joining, I was working at a car insurance, uh, car insurance firm um, with actually one of the other senior software engineers at Trilotech. Um, we sort of both came across sort of within about a month of each other. And that was in some ways like very disjoint like very different like field that you're working on uh very different sort of customer base as well um but in a way like a lot of different tech jobs sort of map onto each other so that every every different job you sort of pick up some new skills that you sort of then take forward into the next job and some experience to say well actually like this problem might not be exactly the same but if you sort of squint and look at it from a slightly different angle you kind of have already solved this maybe you've solved this before, or maybe there's like parts of the problem that you can break down into things that you solved before. And that allows you to really like bring your experience forward and like actually sort of have sort of more input on things over time. So that was, um, while it was sort of quite, quite different in terms of like workplace and like actual sort of day-to-day -day things that I was working on and indeed like knowledge I had about the, about the system, especially at the start. Uh, I had sort of, in the course of my like relatively short career so far, um, started to go sort of more down the sort of functional programming route. And Tazos was, uh, or, or working at Trilotech was something that I could do to sort of continue that path. But also, I haven't I haven't like done that exclusively, um, as as we'll get into later with like the smart smart rollups and so on. There were um, different different problems that I came up that I maybe wasn't necessarily expecting at the start. I mean, I think one of the, I guess, the opportunities and pitfalls of engaging with a new technology is that you don't necessarily know everything your role is going to entail just because 
it hasn't been discovered yet. But, you know, as a core member of the development team at Trilitech, could you tell me a bit more about what your specific role does entail and, you know, the projects or the areas you're, specific, you're specifically involved with when it comes to Tezos? Sure. Um, like, like, like you say at the start, I really didn't know what I was going to be working on. The problem domain seemed so vast and it, it still does seem like, and is very, very big. And that's one of the most exciting things about working in this space is just the sheer almost possibility of uh, problems to solve. Um, I mean, it is so cool that uh, you can solve sort of one thing one day and then learn a huge amount of stuff from, from uh, the people around you uh, on the days following. I think the first six months that I was working here, every night I went home just buzzing from the amount of sort of new stuff that I'd picked up. And that has sort of translated a bit to, to the work that I've been doing at Trellatech. I mean, I've mainly been focusing on uh, the sort of roll-up story, especially on the sort of developer side, like the, uh, the programs that you write to actually run in the roll-ups as opposed to the, the infrastructure itself. Uh, but more recently, over the, the last sort of three and a half months, I've been very focused on the, the Ledger app sort of revamp that we've been doing. And um, hopefully there'll be sort of more, more news about that in the near future, uh, bringing the, the Tezos app up to date and so on. So it's been, it's been quite varied. So I want to dig into rollups because that's a term we hear very often when it comes to Tezos' scalability. And for those of us, myself included, who are not necessarily the most technical people, could you help me define what a rollup actually is? Sure. So at a, at a very high level, um, there are sort of two or maybe sort of three things that are often competing in the, in the blockchain space. Um, it's called the like blockchain trilemma, where you have you know, scaling um, or like execution scaling is uh, against or set up against like decentralization and also like data, data throughput um, and various, various other things that play into that. And rollups are very much targeted at sort of being able to scale execution. So they give you a mechanism to say, OK, I want some computation to be done. And that computation can happen off chain. But I still want to have like very good security guarantees about uh, how that computation is done and that it's done correctly. So that turns into um, this thing where you sort of post, right now you sort of post messages to, to the rollups uh, and those messages are included into blocks and they get picked up by the rollups processed. Uh, they can update their own like internal state and send messages back to layer one. Um, and there are some mechanisms in place to ensure that as long as you have one person sort of operating the rollup correctly, the rollup is completely secure, which is actually almost a better uh, security guarantee than like layer one itself has. Um, so on, on layer one, you need sort of, on, on a lot of blockchains, you need like those sort of honest majority assumption where like you need like at least half of people to be like following the rules correctly for the, for the chain to be secure. But given if we can assume like layer one is, is secure, then the roll up security guarantees are, 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 are much better. And is this where we come into the terminology of the optimistic roll-up? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the term optimistic is effectively saying, well, by default, we can probably assume that the people operating the roll-up are doing so correctly, but we have a mechanism in place so that if one, one or more people start behaving in a sort of, um, start trying to cheat the system or sort of do a state transition that isn't allowed, classic example would be all the L2 funds go into my account, uh, as long as there is one person preventing sort of there and like defending the roll-up, then it's uh, all, all those people will, will lose and get their, their bonds slashed. Right. Okay. So it essentially works on the principle that even if you could not trust the uh, whoever is operating the roll-up, that there is enough security within the system itself to check and counter any breaks in that security. Is that right? Exactly. So um, multiple multiple people can't operate the rollup at the same time. 
Um, mm -hmm. In fact, it's probably quite nice if you have multiple people operating the rollup because then they can all sort of agree on agree with each other. And as long as they're like agreeing, then it's it's great because if one of those people are honest, then everyone's sort of agreeing to the same thing, which is the correct thing. Uh, but we we don't allow sort of finalization of that state for two weeks, uh, which is where like the 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 actual like, opt optimism comes into it. Like if if nobody challenges the commitment. Uh, or like the state transitions within like that two week period, then the uh, commitment can be assumed to like be correct and is sort of cemented and becomes finalized, at which point things like layer two to layer one, like withdrawals can take place and so on. But uh, the, we need that two week period to allow the honest operator to challenge any incorrect commitments as well. And then all in all, this is a, basically a big exercise to achieve kind of more computation without necessarily requiring an increase of hardware on Tezos as a layer one. Is that is that right? Exactly. Like if we if if you if you I mean you could scale layer one by like requiring everybody to run like much beefier machines and then you could have like higher throughput. But as as you say, like that is that sort of discourages decentralization. Um, People like may not be able to afford like the hardware requirements anymore, um, or decide it was just like not worth the effort and, and stop validating. And over time, that can have like a very centralizing effect. But if if we can say, well, actually, we want the execution to take place, and the execution can take place on like more powerful hardware, and that's fine because we only need like a handful of people to actually be running that, then it's then it's okay. And. Going back to what we were saying about there are multiple kinds of rollup, and you mentioned that Tezos uses optimistic rollups, but why is that considered the optimal solution for Tezos against other ones like zero knowledge? Or what is what is the competitive competitive advantage that is gained by using optimistic rollups versus other types? So, I guess there's kind of a bunch of different sort of flavors of of rollup. So, for for us, we we have like the optimistic enshrined enshrined rollup. So, on the sort of optimistic versus zk side, um, zero zero knowledge rollups might have some advantages in terms of like instant finality rather than having to wait that two week period. But their throughput is much much lower, like order, almost orders of magnitude lower than you can actually achieve in a optimistic rollup because as you do the computation in a zero knowledge rollup, you're having to constantly prove that you're effectively doing the computation correctly. So that gives like a very, very high uh, computational overhead to actually doing doing much in a ZK rollup. So you'll tend to see like throughput numbers in a ZK rollup be like almost single digits, just purely for the amount of uh, the amount of sort of extra computation that's, that's required there. Whereas an optimistic rollup doesn't have to do that. It, it just has to say, well, Okay, I mean, on the individual transactions, I'm like verifying signatures to make sure they they came from people who who claim that they're coming from. But I'm not having to I'm not having to sort of keep this sort of additional tally of of, of various things. I can literally just run run the code, no almost almost no overhead. And as long as like I'm agreeing with other people, it's it's okay. And how does this all feed into sort of Tezos's upgradability and how seamlessly they connect? Because as Tezos core technology upgrades, do, do, and does anything need to change with regard to the rollups, or do they kind of streamline together? Yeah, so that's that's where like the enshrined nature of rollups sort of plays very well. So on many like other chains, um, like Arbitrum and Optimism on Ethereum being good examples, like rollups are uh, sort of contract rollups. So sort of the contract rollup versus like enshrined rollup talks about the like layer one, layer two bridge. So in like Arbitrum and Optimism's case and many, many other rollups, sort of the, the logic of like who's allowed to validate the rollup or how like um, disagreements are, are handled is all handled inside like smart contracts. And that logic can be like very complicated and quite very, very hard to implement as well. Um, and can also be have like quite a centralizing effect on the rollup. Like if it only allows certain people or like a whitelist of people to, to be validators, then that obviously prevents like anybody from participating in the rollup. Um, 
And so you, you it's maybe like the, the, the trust assumption there is like quite a lot. Um, you're having to trust people quite a lot more that the rollup is is being operated correctly. But for, on Tezos, um, they rollups are enshrined. So this layer one, layer two bridge is actually implemented in the protocol itself rather than in sort of inside any sort of smart contract. And that allows um, that allowed us like m many more like powerful tools to actually implement the the bridge correctly, make sure that we actually had working reputation games, which is which is uh, very rare, and actually upgrade rollups or give rollups new powers with layer one protocol migrations. So rollups launched on mainnet in the Mumbai upgrade, and then more recently we had like Nairobi go live as well. And Nairobi actually introduced new features for rollups, including uh, new functions for like the, the kernels that run inside the rollups to be able to call to like interact with the, the outside world a bit differently. So kernels um, kernels are like informed when a protocol upgrade takes place, they can react to it. Um, they themselves are upgradable and can implement their own logic to do so. So it's something that over time, like as like deployed rollups evolve, they can evolve like together with layer one and get ever better over time. And for just a quick point of clarity, what exactly is a kernel? So um, the rollup is sort of two parts. It's the it's the infrastructure which sort of communicates with, with layer one, makes mm -hmm. things like storage available. The kernel is the program that actually runs inside the, the rollup itself. So effectively, it's sort of called on a loop with uh, here, is, here is some new input that you can do stuff with. Um, you have functions to like write messages back to layer layer one, and you have functions to access your like storage that um, you can sort of update over time. So classically, like that could be like an account ledger for like uh, assets that you might have on layer two. So the, the the kernel is the is is the program that effectively determines what the what the role does with the information that's given. Um, and that's 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 the sort of area where I've probably spent the most time focusing um, while I've been at Trilly. No, thank you. That was uh, super thorough, and I think it's something that even I managed to grasp. So <laughs> I really, I really appreciate it. But I think one of the major questions that this all boils down to is when it comes to you know the eventual end user, how does this, how is this like perceived by them, or how does it benefit the person that's at the very end of the chain who isn't as I guess immersed in the infrastructure layers of Tezos as a blockchain? Sure. So, I think I think the idea is that like most people who will like be be like users in the Tesla ecosystem like won't be there like programming rollups directly, but they may they may interact with it. So, uh, rollups unlock quite a few different use cases. Um, but one of the exciting ones um, that is actually sort of coming up in a nearish sort of nearish future, I guess is uh, the, the EVM rollup. So the Etherlink was announced um, at uh, ECC and then also again at uh, Tesdev. And it is the sort of public good uh, Ethereum compatible rollup for Tesos. And that allows end users who may have like experience in like Ethereum, in the Ethereum world and like experience with Ethereum dApps to actually interact within the, like, the Tesos ecosystem, these Ethereum these Ethereum dApps actually deployed on the Tezos rollup. So developers might use some some developers might like deploy dApps from elsewhere, like on top of a rollup. Um, like there's another rollup in the works called uh, Tezos on Tezos, which uh, allows you to run like Tezos dApps in a rollup as well. So developers might deploy on top of like a public good rollup. In certain cases where like an app chain makes sense for them, like for example, if you were writing a game and you wanted to put some of the logic into a rollup, then you would probably want to actually directly have like a lot of control over what the what the kernel and what the rollup is doing. So you would probably go a bit lower level and actually write the the actual rollup program. And as an end user, you get to interact with the with the rollup kind of how you would with a sort of D app on layer one, on Tezos, or maybe even like an Ethereum. The app, but like deployed on the, the layer two. 
Okay, very interesting. And um, just earlier, you mentioned Tes Dev Paris, and I, I saw that you actually recently spoke at the event, and you gave a visual demonstration of the 1 million transactions per second on Tezos. And of course, I'm not going to ask you to, you know, give a 10 minute presentation of exactly what you demonstrated at the event. But could you give us like a rough summary of what that demo and that test entailed? Sure. So right at the start, when we were thinking about the design and, and how like bots might actually look like, we wanted to make sure that rollups could actually be used for this sort of horizontal scalability and like much higher throughput. So the the demo was conceived as a as a as a nice way to actually showcase that we have sort of achieved the goal of like horizontal scalability that we sort of set out to. So it was it was like very clear like right from the beginning, and it was never a goal to have like a million transactions per second on a single rollup. But it was like a nice round number that we knew we could hit if we deployed lots of rollups working in power in parallel and showed that like computation can and throughput can scale as you deploy more rollups. So the the demo itself showcases uh, a thousand rollups all deployed on MondayNet, which is one of the public test networks, um, all, all running in parallel, receiving messages in parallel, and uh, updating, updating the state and responding to that. So it's what it actually shows is the transaction kernel, which is uh, allows transfers of uh, Tezos uh, like tickets between accounts in layer two. Um, and it writes out to its own like debug log, sort of what each sort of transaction actually is sort of represented. So the actual representation was uh, a series of images that changes, so each image changes every block. And we set it up so uh, an image itself was five megapixels, which for like if you have like red, green, and blue components in each pixel, that turns into 15 million pixel updates per block to uh, transition from one image to the next. Um, and that sort of conveniently allows us, because Monday night at the time had 15 second block times, to say, well, if we have um, a thousand rollups all running at a thousand transactions per second, then that maps into the uh, million transactions per second or this one like 15 million uh, pixel updates uh, from going from one image to the next. So, and so, yeah. so what actually makes a test like this so significant? I mean, you know, how does, how does a million transactions per second on Tezos compare to its other blockchain competitors? And like, what makes this such a profound moment in terms of the development advancement of Tezos? So, it, it really showcased, I think, that we have rollups, they work, and we built them for real. Uh, we, we, we demonstrated them on a, on a, proper, um, on a proper test network. Um, we showcased as well the uh, ability to scale like the data throughput as well. So we leveraged the data, data availability committees, which is one of the two so like data availability solutions that, are, that have been like worked on uh, currently at Tezos in Tezos, and ultimately that yeah we we said we were going to do something we we did it and that where there are use cases for people who need like very very high uh, transactional throughput that you know Tezos is a place that they can actually come and like build build those things for real, and uh, ultimately it means that like actually you can come and like write a write a rollup kernel and operate a operate a rollup. You don't have to rely on like necessarily like huge, huge rollups who kind of say that like that you kind of have to like trust to like actually implement all the rules correctly. You can actually build it yourself for real, which is uh, I think very unique. Right. So it kind of highlighted the true functionality and capability of Tezos technology in, let's face it, an industry filled with big promises with very little execution sometimes. So it was very good to, I guess, see a, a visual demonstration of something in action to make it a tangible function, exactly. yes. Yeah. And so, I mean, of my knowledge of the Tezos ecosystem, especially with regards to like the core developer teams, 
it's known for having quite a strong network. It's not just Trilotech. There's also Nomadic Labs, there's Functory, there's a few others as well. So when it comes to working on, you know, something as, as significant as roll-ups, what's the experience of working within and across these teams? So I mean, kind of kind of twofold. So um there was I think I think at the start there was like quite a lot of um like little little like niggles that we that we found, like where actually coordination across uh, entities can be quite difficult. And uh to to be fair, like this this was something that had like was very much like in motion and improving a lot, like before Trilotech was even ever a thing. And um Effectively, over time, it sort of turns. It, it has turned into sort of almost one big, one big team, and the entity that you work for does affect, like quite, quite, like it does have an effect on like your day to day and um, indeed, like what you'll necessarily be working on. But at least within core development, the there is a lot of effort to sort of synchronize cross entity and make sure that people from different entities, like multiple entities are working together on particular projects. So on, on the roll-up side, uh, we had, for almost the entire project, we've, we've had engineers from Trilotech and Nomadic Labs, uh, Functory, and uh, at times Marigold as well. Um, and they, we've had sort of weekly, weekly meetings to sort of talk through the problems we were having. Um, somebody from one of the entities or maybe a couple of people would be like in charge of specific projects, which sort of were individually working together to like the overarching goal of actually being able to launch rollups. So, I mean, coordination in a sort of decentralized system is, is hard, I guess, but um, over over time it's, uh, we've got like much more used to like working, working with each other and uh, dealing with, with time zones and everything like that. So what are some of the, I guess, the primary benefits of working in this fashion? Because in a in a almost symbolic kind of way, it's a decentralized way of working. And so I guess, you know, there might be a division of duties or at least a diversity of perspectives as it relates to the same problem. So what are sort of the, you know, the benefits and also maybe some of the challenges that you've specifically found in this in this network? I mean, we very much have uh, different different points of view, uh, which we then need to like actually talk about and sort of work out how to how to move forward. Um, for example, like a lot of the people who work at Nomadic Labs are extremely extremely clever, have have PhDs, and like have a very very strong like theoretical understanding of of, of various things, which I couldn't hope to comprehend, but. At the same time, like we ultimately need to take like theory and all all these things and implement it in practice. And you know, sometimes sometimes like the the nice solution, if you like think about something and like uh, this this would be nice, actually turns out to be like very difficult to implement. Or if you change your assumptions slightly, something becomes much more implementable. So it's it's not to say like and there's anybody at, at one particular entity who is like better at a certain thing than others. It's just, you know, you just have like diversity of of thought and um, or indeed like of understanding of a problem that can lead to like very nice like novel, novel ways of looking at things. And I would assume for that for the sake of efficiency, each of these teams sort of specializes or is focused on different areas within Tezos core development. Yeah. So when it comes to, you know, Trilotech, what does Trilotech specialize in in particular? So we have like quite a few people who have worked in the sort of rollout space. Uh, there are people currently working on the sort of um, other projects around like block time and indeed have like worked on data availability in the past as well. So it's actually not always the case that like each entity is responsible for like for certain things. They they might have like specialisms in certain areas, but that might come more from the developers actually working on certain teams more often. So core, core development as a whole is sort of split into the sort of four big sort of overarching teams, um, production, shell, protocol, and uh, rollups. And they'll usually be like in each of those teams, there'll be engineers from 
each of the entities. And then again, those teams will get broken down further into sort of smaller, smaller sections who then may have like individual projects they're working on. So it's over time, it's sort of been organized in a sort of much more structured fashion, I guess. I mean, I guess it takes, <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of software engineers are very solutions focused. So that sounds like a very logical and pragmatic way to frame, you know, duties and responsibilities. Um, we've covered a lot of ground and I think based on what you were saying, there's a lot that you guys are staying busy on. But one question that always gets me curious is that what's, you know, what's one area that you're particularly excited about and particularly excited to work on in the near future? Um, so I have been working quite a lot on the uh, Ledger, Ledger app, as I, um, as I mentioned earlier. Something that I'm quite excited to work on in the near future is the, uh, is the baking app as well. So we've, we've been doing a lot of work making the experience of the Wallet app nicer for, for users. And hopefully once that's uh, released, um, we'll switch to hopefully doing the same for the baking app, like hopefully reducing the time it takes for it to uh, sign, sign blocks and transactions a bit more. And hopefully that will lead to sort of a nicer experience for the, for the bakers as well. Um, but then after that, I, I'm not yet sure what I'll, uh, what I'll be working on because that will be uh, sort of a, another sort of quarter away, but potentially I'm very excited to sort of go back to, to roll-ups and some of the exciting things that are sort of starting to bubble, bubble away there. I mean, based on the earlier part of our conversation, it was clear that one of the things that excites you is the fact that you don't know what's coming up next. And I think that's what keeps everyone on edge and on their toes and it, it keeps everything interesting. So we'll just have to see. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, I'll find out, but I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Well, Emma, I think you have provided some of the most lucid explanations of very, very technical material. And I want to thank you so much for your insights. It's been very educational and very illuminating. So so thank you so much. And I think, you know, as as more of Tezos's upgrades and progress take place, we'll have you back on the show and to, you can explain it all to us then as well. Love to. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much for, for having me on. All right. Thanks so much, Emma. Brilliant. Bye. Thanks.